All right. Well, thank you everyone again for joining us today. My name is Filipina Sandoval, and I am the TTA manager here at NCHPH. And today we're going to be presenting on tobacco cessation for homeless individuals and public housing residents, a brief preview. And this webinar is presented to you uh, by the National Health Care for the Homeless Council and the National Center for Healthy Public Housing. And we also have uh, today Frank Vitali, who, will, who is joining us today from Purdue College. So this is just some reminders about uh, Zoom and all of the chat functions that we have. So all participants are muted upon entry. Please make sure that you also engage in the chat if you have any questions or anything else that you would like to share with us regarding promising practices, any strategies or challenges that you may be experiencing in your organization related to today's topic. Also raise your hand if you would like your line to be unmuted. The meeting is also being recorded and the slides and recorded link will be sent to you via email after today's webinar. So before we begin, the mission of the National Center for Housing Public Housing is to strengthen the capacity of federally funded public housing primary care health centers and other health center grantees by providing training and a range of technical assistance. And then again, this is just a brief introduction about all of our speakers for today. My name is Fia Pineda, and I am the TTA manager for NCHPH, so I'm going to be helping with uh, moderating today's webinar. We also have Dr. Jose Leon, who is our chief medical officer at NCHPH. He's going to be providing some background information about public housing and uh, smoking cessation facts. Elena, we also have Elena Boyer, who is the Senior Director of Programs for the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. And we also have Frank Vitali, who is the National Director of Pharmacy Partnership for Tobacco Cessation and the Clinical Assistant Professor at Purdue University College of Pharmacy. So Elena Boyer, she, Dr. Boyer, is the Senior Director of Programs at the National Health Care for the Homeless Council and supports the implementation, research, community engagement, and clinical quality improvement teams. Previous to being promoted to senior director, she spent the past seven years as a director of implementation research team, working to highlight the evidence base of promising practices for providers who care for persons experiencing homelessness. And uh, Frank Vitali is also the national director of the Pharmacy Partnership for Tobacco Cessation, it has worked in the smoking cessation field since 1987, designing cessation programs, educating over 20,000 health professionals in how to help patients stop tobacco use, and counseling nearly 10,000 patients to quit. He is currently a clinical assistant professor at Purdue's College of Pharmacy, working on a myriad of projects designed to train pharmacists, physicians, respiratory therapists, and other clinicians interested in adding cessation counseling to their practice. Okay, and now we'll pass it on to Dr. Jose Leon, who will be providing background information on health centers that are close to public housing. Thank you, Fide, and good afternoon, or good morning to you, depending on where you are in the country. Thank you so much for being with us uh, and discuss this relevant topic uh, sometimes uh, we believe that uh, tobacco use disorder is something that we have under control, but let's make sure that we review the basics. Let's make sure that we understand uh, any promising practices. So Frank is going to go over uh, the content, uh, the basic of uh, smoking cessation. And before we get started, I'm just going to discuss a little bit of the uh, health centers close or immediately accessible to public housing out of the 13 over 1300 uh, FQACs, uh, 107 are public housing primary care grantees. And in 2022, uh, they serve over 900,000 patients. There is also uh, something important to mention uh, and is that uh, 483 health centers uh, said that they are uh, in or immediately access accessible to public housing. And in the same year, they serve uh, 6.1 million patients. Next slide, please.
important to mention the uh, demographics of those living in public housing. There are about 1.5 million uh, people living in public housing. And I always mentioned uh, some of the uh, vulnerable populations living in public housing. I would like to mention this time that 38% uh, of the household report to have at least one uh, person with a disability, that 19% are over the age of 65, 36% are children under the age of 18, and uh, in regards to uh, race and ethnicity, 43% are African-American and 26 are uh, Latino or Hispanic. Next slide, please. Data taken from UDS, and this is the data uh, from table 6B, which, which shows uh, the preventive uh, care screening, uh, tobacco use screening and cessation intervention. And as we see here, uh, health centers are doing a really nice work uh, assessing patients for tobacco use. And if they are current smokers, they uh, provide inter interventions. So um, the, norm, the percentage is about 84.6, almost 85% of health centers are assessing tobacco use and are referring patients for interventions. Next slide, please. This is from the uh, patient survey, the latest from HUD. And uh, we are going to pay attention to two uh, numbers here. Uh, one is the confidence interval. The other one is the p-value, which is uh, whether or not what we're saying is significant, uh, statistically speaking. And uh, the confidence interval, which, which uh, shows the range of real possibility. Next slide, please. Uh, for this one uh, in particular, we analyzed three groups, uh, all patients. Um, then uh, we analyzed uh, those who are hot assisted and those living in public housing. Next slide, please. In regards to uh, the percentage of those who are current smokers, we see that uh, uh, those uh, being served by public housing primary care uh, are more likely to be uh, smokers when you compare them to uh, all uh, hot assisted and all other housing. Then this again, this is based on the uh, patient survey uh, 2022 from uh, from um, from Persa. Next slide, please. Also, um, those living in public housing are more likely to say that they have the plan in the future to quit the smoking. And so this is extremely important. The number is similar to the, or the percentage is similar to the 84% of uh, the uh, health centers are saying that they are assessing and referring patients to their resources if uh, the patient is a current smoker. Next slide, please. Now, the desire to stop is a number that uh, I would like you to pay attention to uh, because 90 2.7% of those living in public housing are saying that uh, they would like to stop smoking. And I am referring to the one th the 32 or 33% of current smokers. So uh, the message that I would like to convey is that even though we are referring patients to all the tobacco cessation programs, we are still having patients who are trying to stop smoking. So in addition to assess and refer patients, we need to make sure that we follow up uh, with this patient and see whether or not the program they are into is working for them. Let's make sure that we assess uh, other needs from our patients and make, uh, make sure that we discuss with our patients and take some time to discuss with our patients that uh, smoking is, uh, uh, if you are a current smoker, you are more likely to have uh, other conditions uh, such as asthma, uh, I'm sorry, COPD, or exacerbate other conditions such as asthma, uh, cardiovascular diseases, and diabetes. So it's important to, to make sure that we have this discussion with our patients, even when we refer them to any smoking cessation program. Next slide, please. 
And again, uh, the percentage is uh, high when you compare those living in public housing with those uh, who are either receiving assistance from HUD or, uh, or they do not receive any assistance from HUD. So um, those living in public housing are more likely to smoke, more likely to uh, try not to smoke, and they are smoking every day. Next slide, please. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to my colleague, Alina. Good afternoon, Alina. Great, thank you, Dr. Leon. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that great foundation. I just wanted to share with you all just a little, a few slides on um, through the lens of persons experiencing homelessness and smoking. So um, just wanted to, we can go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to start out sharing with, and this might be very well known, but just also help kind of level set us as we move into um, more information and facts from our expert, is just thinking about the whole person. And so a lot of persons experiencing homelessness, um, we also have very high prevalence level of smokers, but the way that we look at our health center data and those who are actually accessing care at federally qualified health centers where they can then get screen and get smoking um, cessation, uh, treatment, um, just kind of thinking about that population. So if we look at all of the national um, health centers that exist, there are about um, close to about 1400 health centers. The small, um, the dark green pie piece is those experiencing homelessness. So similarly to um, public housing, HRSA also has a subset of health centers that receive specific health care for the homeless funding. And um, and that's what the HCH stands for. So looking down at the pie chart on the left, there are about 299 um, federally qualified health centers that receive specific funds for um, this population. And so you can see that that is a higher representation of persons experiencing homelessness shown by the darker shaded green in the pie chart versus um, those that are in all health centers. And then we also have a subset of health centers too that only receive healthcare for the homeless funds and none other. Their, um, other special populations um, funds. And that looks also very, very similar when we're looking at their patient population. So about 78% of patients that they are seeing are experiencing homelessness and 92% in health centers that receive healthcare for the homeless funding. So just a little bit of grounding of the number of patients that we're speaking um, through. And so one of the things on the right, and this is a very old picture, but very familiar, I'm sure, to all of you all, um, especially as we're rolling out some of the um, vital condition kind of framework now, but looking at the social drivers of health is really helpful in thinking about when we're thinking um, smoking cessation interventions, how do we tailor it to all of these other experiences and traumas that an individual is um, facing and feeling? Um, and so we have a lot of patients who are living in shelter, or on the street in an encampment, possibly in their car. Um, some might have experienced violence and they're at a um, domestic violence shelter. So there's lots of different ways of experiencing homelessness. We have couch surfing as well. So when you take all of that into account in their environment about what is happening socially around them really can contribute to their health um, overall. Next slide. <clears throat> so again, just wanted to highlight here that um, when compared to the general U.S. population, there are um, smoking is more prevalent among homeless populations. We also have a high uh, population of um, it's also in higher prevalence in individuals with mental health disorders and substance use. We have a lot of um, patients with comorbidities. They might already be experiencing a chronic disorder. They also might be co-experiencing mental health disorder as well as um, an alcohol or drug substance use disorder as well. So again, keeping that in mind, we're thinking about tailoring interventions um, and timing of those who are ready to quit. Um, there's also an increased disease bur burden as well within this population. Um, we're also looking at the uniform data system, the UDS data that my colleague um, Jose just shared with you. When we're just looking at those ex patients experiencing um, health, um, ex experiencing homelessness, we saw that there were about two visits per per patient that would visit our health centers and experiencing homelessness. Next slide. Um, okay, and lastly, just looking at um, the slide previously was showing um, those who were screened or had an encounter with a health provider around smoking. And so now looking at um, the follow-up 
how many of those were engaged in cessation counseling in persons experiencing homelessness um, is what we're showing here in this slide. But just briefly on the left, um, as showing some data from the previous health center patient survey data, looking specifically at those who identified as experiencing homelessness. And within that subset of patients, of, of experiencing homelessness and that are current smokers, 54% received advice to quit, 81% of those experienced physical or sexual assault, 80% had a history of mental illness, and 80% had a history of illicit drug or alcohol use. Um, so again, just really highlighting the need to tailor um, interventions in a trauma-informed way and caring about the whole person. Oftentimes, um, Cigarettes can be used as a bartering tool um, in, in certain positions as well on the um, while living in, on the street or in encampments. So just wanted to have that in mind as we're going to hear from our expert moving forward. But um, going back to the health center data, it's very similar to the slide before that at least there were two visits to cessation counseling per person. Um, for patients that are experiencing homelessness and were seen at healthcare for the homeless health centers. Um, I think that's it for me. Just wanted to kind of set the platform before we hand it off to um, Frank Fatal. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So we have a, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes here today to cover a topic that generally I speak on for six hours. So as the title of this says, it's a very brief review. So I'm just going to be kind of giving you the big picture idea here um, about what you can do um, and uh, give you some resources that you can then uh, use to get uh, much more information. I'm going to be, although this is for both audiences, people dealing with homeless individuals and residents of public housing, I'm going to be focusing on the um, individuals who are homeless um, and the little bit of data that is there um, that exists in that area. However, one key thing here for you to start out with is that all of these um, interventions, everything I'm going to be talking about applies to everybody. Um, there is no real evidence that there are any special techniques to be used with this population, that population, these ideas apply to everybody. And so from that perspective, what I wanna start out with are, is a couple big ideas. Number one is that anybody can quit smoking. It's just a matter of finding the right plan for that individual, okay? Anybody can quit, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what all the issues are, um, as we've just noted, you know, many individuals are gonna be talking about or that you work with, um, have all kinds of other problems going on. And you may think, well, um, they'll never be able to quit or what's the point of them quitting? Um, so we're going to go into that in a little more detail. And secondly, I want you to understand that all cessation is individual. So everything I'm going to be talking about here is you can apply to any particular person. And in fact, what you're going to be doing is creating individual treatment plans for um, each person that you are working with, because everybody's different. There isn't one solution. This isn't like, you, you know, you have, uh, if we all had, everybody on this call had a sinus infection, we would all take, uh, you know, amoxicillin for 10 days and pretty much every one of us would be okay and it would go away. This is the exact opposite. There is no one stop shot for this. I personally think that's what makes this interesting and, and, and fun to do because you are working um, very closely with individual patients to help them create a plan specifically for them. So given that these are these are the objectives uh, that we have to have for any of these trainings. Um, and uh, you can just you know, go over those yourself. I'm not going to really take the time. So let's look at what is out there um, for people experiencing homelessness. What is the research? Well, there is an organization called the Cochrane Library, and what they do is they take a specific subject and they look at all the research that's been done on that subject, and then they do a meta-analysis. In other words, they, they combine everything and then look at the results of all these findings together. So 
I usually try to go to them when I do something like this with a specific uh, population in mind to see what's out there. And this is what I found. So as of 2020, so a few years ago, there have only been 10 studies done that looked at specific techniques that work in this population. And as the uh, second bullet point says, there's insufficient evidence to show that there really is any specific tobacco cessation intervention that works in the, uh, with people who are experiencing homelessness. Standard treatment then is most likely to work just fine in this population. So that's what I'm gonna talk about here and give you resources too um, later on to look at that standard treatment. So in the meantime, let's look at the challenge here. As, as has been indicated already, uh, there are lots of other challenges with this population. Primarily is because they don't have permanent addresses, it may be difficult to find these individuals and they may not be coming into clinics. They may not be knowing that there's access to them. So where do you conduct the intervention? To me, it doesn't matter. You can do this in an encampment, you can do it on the street, uh, you know, just get a quiet corner and sit down and talk to somebody. You really don't need to do anything else or go anywhere else other than that. Now, then, so where to do it is pretty much up to you. When to do it, though, there are some issues here because if you are dealing with someone who is using drugs or alcohol, you obviously don't want to do this if they are actively drinking, if they're actively using drugs, if they're if there's some kind of psychiatric illness and they're in the midst of an episode. So more so with these individuals, you're really going to have to kind of focus on when the appropriate time to do it, uh, more so than with other uh, patients. Now, what I want you to realize here is that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. That just means that you really need to wait till they're stable and can understand um, what is going on and, and what you're talking about. The second big issue here is that doesn't appear on the surface that many of these individuals would have any reason to quit. They don't have much else in their lives. Um, everyone around them smokes probably. So more so than again with your other patients, you're really gonna have to look at motivation and helping them find that. And I'll talk about that more specifically in a moment. Thirdly is your beliefs. I think I have encountered, so as, as uh, you've been told, I've been doing this for 35 years now. Part of the problem is many clinicians don't believe that people can quit or that they want to quit. So examine your own beliefs in this area and realize again, these individuals can quit, they do quit just at the same rate as the general population. And as you just saw, um, and that data is excellent, you know, 75, 80% of individuals at any given time tell us they do want to quit. Now, the fourth problem here is, is the consistency of the intervention. So if you do something in one visit, are you gonna be able to follow up? So you really want to structure what you're doing so that you can follow up and that there is some way of getting a hold of people. And then we're gonna be talking about the cessation of medication. So really the other piece of this is you're gonna to have to work uh, to create some kind of plan where you can touch base with these individuals so that you can make sure that they are using the medication that they've chosen uh, appropriately. All right, so that's the challenge. What is the reality? Uh, you know, I've said this several times before, but it, it's, it is uh, worth repeating. Anybody can quit smoking. It's just a matter of, so we know from the data that's out there that individuals with psychiatric or, or behavioral health issues, if, they, if that happens to be the case with the person you're working with, they want to quit at the same rate as the general population. And in fact, they do quit at the same rate as the general population. I created a, a specific webinar about this for the public housing people, and I'll give you the link later on to where you can get that and the other series of um, uh, uh, programs that, I, that we've done over the last couple of years. So then I mentioned motivation. Two big motivators here 
the cost uh, financially and the cost um, health-wise. So the average expenditure right now in the U.S. in a year is about $4,000. So this is becoming very, very expensive. I know I was in New York a couple of weeks ago and in Manhattan, and it was up to $18 a pack. Um, so this is something that you really can work with your, your, your patients in terms of Where's this money coming from? Why, where are they getting it? And more importantly, couldn't they be using it on something else? You know, that like food and you know, maybe finding shelter, finding a place to live, et cetera. So that's one motivator. The second one obviously is health. So what we know from any work with people with substance abuse issues and individuals with psychiatric or behavioral health issues they're not, by and large, and this is just a generality, they're not dying from those things. They're dying from smoking-related illnesses. And that's because there are close to 5,000 compounds in tobacco smoke that contribute to, and I'll show you on the next slide, all these gases, particles, there is nothing good in, in a cigarette. So the nicotine is the addictive substance that keeps you hooked but it's all the rest of this stuff that is actually creating the health problems. Um, so even if you did cut down to a few cigarettes a day, you're still getting all of these um, poisons into your system. So that's something to point out to your uh, individuals is that this product contains all kinds of nasty, nasty things, and they cause all of these problems. So oh, this is not obviously a comprehensive list of all the issues that smoking causes. I just wanted you to see that it affects every single system of the body, inside and out. And that if you have someone that you're working with who smokes, it's either causing the illness that they're being treated for, it's exacerbating the symptoms of that illness, or we know that smoking impairs immune response. So smokers, people who smoke get sick more often than people who don't, and they stay sick much longer, in some cases, two or three weeks. So it is affecting their health, even if it isn't apparent to you or them, something's going on. And so what I would like you to do is to really help them understand how smoking is negatively affecting their their body and, and their system. And again, it's fascinating, you know, you see um, some people who are abusing drugs and alcohol, uh, if you look at the aggregate data, they are dying from smoking related illnesses, not from the drug or the alcohol that they're abusing. So it's important, it's very important that we don't ignore this. No matter who you are on this call, you can have an impact on an individual that you're working with. So I, I hear that all the time is what can I do? You know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a you know, respiratory therapist or a pharmacist or whatever. It doesn't matter. I want you to remember this really, really important thing. You just might be the person this particular patient will pay attention to. So in all these years with all the people that I have um, trained, that's my one big message. We never know who is going to have the impact on that particular patient. So I advocate that all health care professionals in all settings at all times advise individuals to quit because that you may have a relationship with that person or they just might like you, you know, for some reason, um, they, you know, you, you, you connect with them. And so they'll pay attention to what you have to say. So as, um, as you saw uh, a few minutes ago, most people do want to quit. This isn't a hard sell anymore. I think most people do realize um, what it's doing. It's just they don't know how to do it successfully. So that's where you come in. You, in the very brief time that I have today, I'm just going to tell you what you can tell people and what they have to do in order to quit successfully. You don't necessarily have to do it, but your role is to educate them in what they need to do. So what is that? Well, 
the big overall idea here is that there are two parts to smoking, so there are two parts to quitting. Smoking is both a physical addiction to nicotine, and it is a real addiction for 99% of the people who smoke. But it's also a habit. It's a behavior. And so in order to quit successfully, so this, all the research out there, all of my experience, all of my colleagues' experiences, very clearly show that in order to quit successfully, you need to deal with both of these aspects simultaneously. So let's look at the medication part first. There are seven FDA-approved medications for cessation. This is the all there is. There aren't nothing else has been approved. So five of them are nicotine replacement therapies. So what they are doing is giving the individual nicotine in a different form so that they can slowly taper themselves. If somebody quits smoking abruptly, in most cases, they go through withdrawal, significant withdrawal, irritability, anxiousness, restlessness, impatience, all kinds of negative emotions that most people, most of the time, have difficulty dealing with. So what these five medications do is give you a lower amount of nicotine and so that you can slowly taper yourself off of it. And it's giving you nicotine slower than when you inhale it through your lungs via a cigarette. So that's, what's re that's what makes quitting abruptly so difficult. You're getting a lot of it, nicotine very, very fast. So these are giving you less nicotine, but enough to keep you out of withdrawal. And then you can slowly, they give it to you at a much slower rate so that you're not physically addicted to any of these medications. And then you can taper yourself off of them. So we have three of them are over the counter. That means you can just go into a store and buy them um, without a prescription, nicotine gum, lozenge, and patch. So you're probably familiar with those. And then there are two others, a nasal spray that is like Flonase that many people use for um, allergies. It's in the same, it's an aqueous solution sprayed in your nose. And then there's an inhaler that looks like a fake cigarette. And then there are two medications that are not nic containing nicotine. Bupropion, which is Welbutrin, which is an antidepressant, and Varenicline, which is a class all by itself. Um, and it's... Uh, the brand name is Chantix, and now there are um, uh, generic versions available. So these are the only ones that are uh, FDA approved. I'm just going to go through them very briefly so that you have a general idea of what's there. And nicotine gum, it looks like a chiclet. You can see in the picture there, it should not be chewed like regular gum. So this is something where you're going to really have to have them educated on how to use it. Therefore, I suggest if somebody wants to use this, that they talk to a pharmacist. It comes in two strengths and all kinds of flavors. Lozenge looks like a Tums, and pretty much you just suck on this. So with the gum, you have to activate it by biting down on it and then leave it alone between your cheek and your gum. Many people find this very problematic, difficult to do. So that may not be the best choice for most of the people that you're working with. The lozenge, on the other hand, you just suck on it and it just dissolves. Um, it comes in this uh, uh, size of about Tums and then it, there's a mini version that looks like Tic Tacs. And that comes in two and four milligrams and then um, many different flavors. The patch, on the other hand, I'm sure you're familiar with. This is a... a, a, a or through the skin. You can see in the picture, it, it just looks like a big Band-Aid. You take the back off, you pat, put it on your arm or your upper chest or um, you know, place where there isn't much hair and you just forget about it. And you use a new one every 24 hours. And this comes in three levels. So you step down those three levels. With the gum and the lozenge, you can step down much more slowly so you can go from like 20 pieces a day to 19 to 18 to 17. So um, that's the advantage of that. The patch, you don't have to think about. So these are the, the ones you can get in any drugstore, uh, Walmart, uh, you know, et cetera. The nasal spray um, is prescription only. As you can see, it is a spray bottle. 
again, much like all those allergy medications out there. Uh, this is not very well used over the you know, over the last 20 years because it's very irritating. It feels like pepper spray when you spray nicotine in your nose. So this has not been very the nicotine inhaler, as you see here, looks like a fake cigarette. There is a, a, a cartridge, a sponge in there that has the nicotine in it. Um, you put it between the, the two parts out. You are um, smoking. This is called a Nicotrol inhaler. That's the only version available. Now, it's my understanding and my colleagues that this is being discontinued because the, the plastic to make this um, uh, the an actual inhaler is now impossible to get. So they the company has just started decided to discontinue it. I think by the end of the year. But as far as I know, it's still available in some parts of the country. So those are the nicotine replacement products. Two others, as I said, bupropion, which does not contain nicotine. It's exactly the same as Wellbutrin. Plus a product called Zyban that was exactly the same as Wellbutrin, but since it was uh, used for cessation, the FDA mandated that it have uh, the uh, company that makes Zyban decided a couple of years ago that it really wasn't worth it anymore, so they stopped making it. So you can, an individual can still use Wellbutrin or gen or generic bupropion. Um, it's a tablet uh, that is a uh, uh, sustained release. Uh, this works very well, very easy to take, but it should not be used with individuals who have seizure disorders or head trauma. And then finally, the last product that's on the market and it's been on the market for the last 15 years. So um, as you can see, there's really been nothing new since then, since this is the newest one, um, is Varenicline. It does not contain nicotine. It was manufactured uh, under the name of Chantix for many, many, many years. Um, my understanding though, is that earlier this year, there was some problem in the manufacturing of it. The, the batches were tainted with something, so they stopped making it um, with the intent of restarting by the end of the year. And as far as I know, Pfizer has decided not to uh, start making it again. So it's only available in generic versions, which started at the beginning of the year. Um, and the future availability of Chantix, I, I, I'm guessing it's not, they're not gonna go back making it because the generic versions are available. And hopefully there is one generic version and hopefully there'll be a few more um, so that this medication can be available because it is does have the highest quit rate of any of the other ones. All right, so what can you say about these medications? You, you know, since you're not a doctor or a pharmacist, um, what are you allowed to say? Well, first of all, I, I you certainly can tell them, the individuals that you're working with, that these Some individuals may not know that. So you can point out to them what, what, what each one of these uh, work and then advise them that using one of these medications significantly increases their chances of quitting. So if you use a medication by itself, you double your chances of quitting successfully. If you use medications in combination, then you are tripling or quadrupling a person's chances of quitting successfully. You can also let them know that it's important to be in some kind of behavior change program at the same time you're using the medication. And you can let them know that other than the patch, the gum and lozenge, they need a prescription to get the other four medications. Then if somebody's interested, refer them to a pharmacist or a physician in many states now, pharmacists can prescribe all these medications, but even if you're in a state where they can't prescribe, they still know about them and they can advise somebody um, about which one would be better for them to use. And if a prescription is needed, they simply call a doctor and they can get it. However, I want to point out that do not recommend any specific medication. You're not in a position um, to be able to do that, and that could cause a lot of issues. Um, if you are uh, telling an individual to use a specific medication. 
But as you see, there's a lot you can do around this. So don't hesitate to talk to um, the people that you're working with about these medications. Now, what can you do on the, on the counseling side, the behavior side? Well, what I would like to suggest is that you don't try to do this yourself other than providing support, encouragement, but rather that you refer them to another source to actually get the cessation. So this falls into the protocol that we've created called Ask, Advise, and Refer. So when we're looking at the protocol that was designed many, many years ago for health professionals to use that I teach all the time, it's these five, it's called the five A's. Ask all patients about tobacco use, advise those who used to quit, then assess their readiness to quit. If they're ready, then assist them by creating a quitting plan. If they're not ready, help them um, become motivated to quit. If they've already quit, help them stay quit. So that's the assist part. And then arrange is follow up. Because this usually, for most people, most of the time can't be done in one um, intervention. So that's the total protocol that we have doctors, et cetera, use. In your case, we want you to ask everyone about uh, whether or not they use tobacco or vape or use any kind of nicotine containing product advise those who used to quit, and then refer them to another resource to actually. The easiest one that I would like to suggest to you is the quit line. Every state has a free tobacco cessation quit line. Every one of them can be reached by this number, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Wherever you're at, if you call that number, it directs you into your state's quit line. These are by specifically trained counselors, usually they're master's level nurses or um, um, psychologists, uh, social workers, et cetera. And they create a very specific tailored quitting plan for the person. Uh, normally that's about five to seven sessions. And what's great about this is that I think right now there's probably 35, 40 different languages uh, that are available. So this anybody can access this and, and get the uh, help they need. And in many cases, these quit lines do provide free medications. Now, where else can you refer? Well, as I said, we I've created this um, training for public housing. So many of the clinics have programs in them. So I would suggest that you look up in your area and see who does. You can refer to that. The American Heart Association, the American Lung Association does programming. I've trained a bazillion pharmacists. So many of them are doing counseling right in the pharmacy. Every one of the seven medications that I just told you about has a behavior change program that goes along with it for free. And then if somebody has access to a computer uh, or, or the web, there are several uh, cessation programs uh, that are available that are web-based. The Common X is probably the best one, so that's the one I've listed here. Now, should you suggest vaping? I, I cannot say this strongly enough. No, 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 and no. Vaping is not a way to quit smoking. There is very little evidence that it is successful. What happens in most cases is people end up vaping and smoking um, at the at in the same day, so it really doesn't help very much. And even though we can argue, and I'll agree with this, that vaping is technically safer than smoking um, tobacco, there it's not safe. There are all kinds of chemicals in there. To that, to the point, the the vape, the the smoke that these produce is propylene glycol, and propylene glycol is antifreeze. So I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be um, taking antifreeze into my lungs. So this is not an option. Don't even go there. Uh, don't even think about it. Now, if you want to do more, so let's say you have the ability within your practice and what you're doing, uh, here's what I would suggest you do. You look at um, studying and getting some information on cognitive behavioral therapy. So essentially what we're teaching individuals when they go into a program 
is to change how they think and change what they do so that they're not automatically triggered to want a cigarette in a specific So let's say somebody um, has a cigarette after every meal and they've done this for 25 years, you know, that's thousands and thousands of times that they've finished a meal and then automatically picked up a cigarette. So it, there doesn't, the nicotine level in their body doesn't matter at that point. It's just automatic. So we would tell somebody or we would teach somebody in that situation, um, go brush your teeth after a meal or go take a walk or just do something different. Whatever, whatever it would be would be appropriate to that person's life. And then that would break the pattern, that would break the routine. And then changing how you think is the same thing, is, is the um, um, uh, same issue there. Sorry, I don't know what happened to the computer there. It just blinked off for a second. And then the second thing that I, you could study is motivational interviewing. And the idea here is that this is a way to talk to patients and guide them to telling you that they want to quit rather than you telling them they have to quit. So I always say it this way, this is asking such provocative inf questions and providing them with such powerful information that they tell us they want to do this rather than us hollering at them and telling them they have to do this. Change occurs more likely and more readily if the words come out of the person's mouth themselves rather than being told to do something. So these are really, really, really brief uh, summaries of those two techniques, but you could certainly um, go in and learn a lot more about them if, if, if that's uh, your desire. Even if it isn't, you could have a huge impact here by being the support person for this individual. You know, I found over the years that in many cases, there's nobody else in these individuals' lives who really care that they quit or want them to quit or really helping them quit. So you can have a huge impact by being that person to support and encourage them. Now, if you want to learn more, um, these are some programs here that I have found. Um, the Rx for Change program, um, which I've been a part of at UCSF, there is a training for mental health peer counselors that I wrote. So it's on that curriculum. And that same program we recorded with the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center. So if you are a peer or, or work in that role, those two trainings would be very helpful to you and go into a lot more detail than I can today. And then this is the um, link to the public housing learning collaborative that I've been involved with the last few years. I think at this point there are 10 different trainings on there in, in very specific areas. One's on the medication, one's on uh, behavioral counseling, one's on relapse prevention, um, all those kind of things. So that's available to you here. I would suggest, again, if you want to learn some more, to um, click on those links after this and uh, you'll be able to. And then finally, this is my... Um, email address. If you have any specific questions for me about either setting up a program or working with a specific patient, I'd be more than happy um, to help you. So that's my quick down and dirty presentation. If there's any questions, please let us know. I think we, we have a few minutes here. We can answer some questions. Thank you, Frank, for your uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, before I forget, um, Please make sure that you complete the survey after this webinar. Your answers are very important to us. So make sure you complete uh, the evalu evaluation after the webinar has ended. Um, so um, again, if you have any question for any of us specifically, for, or if you have any question for Frank, please make sure that you can use the Q and A uh, icon um, feature or the chat, and make sure that um, the or if you would like to ask a question verbally, uh, just use the raise hand icon or feature, and your line will be unmuted. Uh, there is a question, Frank. Uh, what are the costs of the different medications? Excellent question. So right now. 
uh, the average cost of smoking in the U.S. per day is about um, eight, nine dollars. So most individuals smoke about a pack a day. Right now, the average cost is about eight or nine dollars. So the patch, the gum, and the lozenge cost way less than that. Um, you know, I'm talking about maybe a dollar, dollar fifty a day. And bupropion is very, very inexpensive because it's an old drug and it's been around a long time. So those four are way cheaper than smoking um, a pack a day. Um, so if you can pay for cigarettes, you can pay for the medications. Now, varenicline, because it has just gone um, generic, those that price is coming down. That was quite expensive. And the other two, um, the... Uh, nicotine inhaler and the nicotine oral uh, um, oral inhaler and the nasal inhaler, those probably are running $10 or $12 um, uh, a day. So those are much more than smoking. Um, so probably would only be applicable if somebody has insurance. And on that note, many, many, many insurances now are covering this and even Medicaid so I'm, I'm a, uh, would be guessing that many of the individuals you are working with are on medical assistance. In most states, I know here in Pennsylvania, um, med medical assistance does cover those cessation medications. So look into that because there just might be coverage for it. Thank you, Frank. Um, so again, if you have any questions, please, uh type your question and you can use uh, the Q&A feature, the chat, or if you would like to ask a question verbally, uh, use the raise hand icon that your line will be unmuted. And while we wait for another question or other questions, Frank, I have one question for you. Sure. Uh, uh, recently, I read an article uh, in the American Journal of Psychiatry about smoking and social determinants of health. And uh, we've been talking about people experiencing homelessness, uh, uh, those living in public housing, that uh, many people who are current smokers are low income, uh, have uh, some mental issues. And uh, they were uh, uh, recommending uh, that uh, in addition to offer the uh, smoking cessation programs and the behavioral health interventions, making sure that you are not stigmatizing patients. So uh, what is your uh, recommendation for uh, trying to help patients without stigmatizing patients? Because sometimes that's a huge concern. Sure. Well, I, I don't, um, other, than, other than making sure that you're not blaming them for doing this. Um, I think that's probably the biggest um, thing. And acknowledging, as Dr. Borner said, uh, many of these individuals, it's interesting, we're seeing as the general population has stopped smoking. So in when I was a kid in the 50s and 60s, half the population smoked and everybody just did it. So as people have stopped, it does seem to have concentrated now into individuals with lower incomes um, and lower education. But we're also seeing that it's many, many of these individuals um, have had trauma in their life. And that that, as Dr. Boyer pointed out, that that's a big reason why they're continuing to smoke. So I think it's, I think it's just, and this just the general way that you treat people anyways, is that um, you look at these, um, from an empathetic point of view, you're not blaming them. And I think that's where the stigma occurs is that we, we just say it's, it's your own fault. You know, you should just be able to stop. And I think it's acknowledging that this, these are most, in, in most cases now, not, those people have quit. It's, these are very complex cases with many different strands that have to be looked at and dealt with. And so I think it's, it's just acknowledging that, um, and, and just saying, okay, this, you're doing this, you want to stop doing it, we know that it's causing all these problems, I'm here to help you. Thank you, Frank. Um, again, if you have uh, questions uh, for Frank, uh, please uh, ask your question, you can type them. 
and you can use the Q&A feature, the chat feature. Uh, Frank, uh, another question. Do we have in the audience a lot of uh, CHWs, community health workers and outreach people and health educators? And sometimes when they are doing the smoking cessation um, uh, education, uh, they get questions from those who are smokers. And one question that I've heard a lot is, am I going to gain weight if I stop <laughs> smoking? Uh, that, and that's a question. Uh, what, what, is, what, what would you recommend to uh, the CHWs? You know, uh, what right. is the best response for that? Yeah, and again, we're dealing with a lot of people who probably aren't eating well because they don't have access to good food. Um, no, it's not. So if you look at the aggregate data, so if we look at it from the, the science, it, you know, it less than one third of people who quit actually gain any weight. And those that do only gain on the average five to six, seven pounds. So it's not the myth. It's just it's a myth out there that a lot of of people have gained, you know, gaining five, 600 pounds and, you know, the, in huge weight gains. That is, I've never seen that happen. Um, so you're really focusing on the same kind of things you would be with anybody when you're talking about weight is eating, um, uh, you know, eating fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, as much fresh uh, food as you can avoiding junk food. And again, I realized that in, in the, many of the individuals that you're dealing with, they're in areas where they can't get a lot of this food. Um, so the advice there is the same as it would be with anything else, but it's, it's, it's a myth that people put on all this weight. A third of the people stay the same weight and a third of the, I've seen people lose weight when they quit because now they have more energy and they can get around and do more things. And so, um, you know, they do tend to, um, uh, lose a few pounds. So again, my best advice is just to work with what you can with what's available to that individual to have them eat as healthy as they possibly can. Thank you, Frank. And Fide, I'm going to need your help. Uh, someone has used the raise an icon. Can you please unmute? Yes. Um, okay. So for the participant, K, Zoe Caldwell, if you could um, just provide a little bit more information about your response, I didn't notice. Um, I can, are you, so I didn't have, um, I would just, he, uh, Frank said right before he uh, wondered how many people were kind of doing like outreach work and things like that. I work for a medical respite um, and we have a, a, a community of tiny homes for people um, who are experiencing homelessness and have had serious medical procedures. So once they, they're referred to us by the hospital, the hospital pays for the duration of their stay. And um, a lot of people come to us and they aren't, they're not smoking anymore. Um, I'm, I'm today, even right before this meeting, I was a little late because I'm dealing with one of our residents who has started smoking again after maybe a year. Um, and so um, just back and forth with wanting more and more. Um, and another resident, I know that, I don't know if, I mean, it sounds like it's not a direct, um, like it, it's not solely from a, so we had one woman she stopped smoking and she gained almost 50 pounds and she feared that she would and we just kind of watched it and she said that there was some kind of sensation she read about some sensation with eating that was the same that was just I don't know equivalent to raising her hand to her mouth uh just like smoking and I I thought it sounded silly and then I witnessed it so maybe that was something that she already had in her mind and then it kind of manifested because um I don't know I know that I've I've stopped smoking and gained a lot of weight too so I just thought it was interesting but I I just put that uh comment before he started speaking so it's good to know that we have a little more control than we realize over over whether or not we'll gain weight well let me put the uh... Those are good points, and yeah, some, some people do get weight. But the matter is, is that weight 
is not going to negatively affect your health or their health like smoking would. So. Uh, Frank, you're, 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 I didn't catch any of that. Your uh, mic is going in and out. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay, somebody, I can hear somebody else talking. That's maybe the problem. What I, what I said was that that amount of weight, no matter what amount of weight you gain, it's not going to negatively affect your health in the same way that smoking is. So it's not, as, you know, that extra weight is not going to be as bad as continuing to smoke. And I think with the individual that you just described, I think she pretty much, you, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. She thought she was convinced she was going to gain weight, so she did. Thank you, Frank. And, and, and thank you uh, for the comment. Uh, we really appreciate that. Frank, we have two more questions, and uh, I think that these are really good questions. Uh, the first one is, is it recommended for people to quit smoking tobacco while being in treatment for alcohol and other drugs? Uh, most of my clients in residential treatment feel like it's the only thing that they have left. How should I address this? Okay, so uh, there is another training that I did specifically for public health that addresses this in great detail. But in, in, a, in a couple sentences here, it absolutely is recommended for people to quit um, tobacco use while they're in treatment for alcohol and other drugs because the data shows that they're much more likely to remain sober if they also quit smoking. There, there is no question about it. I mean, think about it. You're using a substance outside of yourself to deal with your internal problems. So whether it's cocaine or heroin or alcohol or nicotine, it's you're, it's psychologically it's the same process. So yes, it is recommended to, to do that. Now the question becomes what I said at the beginning of the this training is when to do it. Now obviously if the person is actively using or they just stopped using in the last couple of weeks or a month or so, you're not going to want to go into smoking. But I think it's important that you do it at some point when the person is stable and in their sobriety and um, have them understand that this is going to be expected, that this is part of the process. But yes, the, it, the research shows very clearly that they will stay sober longer if they're not smoking. As far as it's the only thing they have left, I I, I hear that all the time. It's simply not true. You know, and that's what I, how I would address it is what else does this person have? You know, whatever it is, you know, whether it's a, a friend, a dog, a cat, um, you know, looking forward to the future, um, there's got to be something else. Because uh, if, if we accept that, then we're condemning them to a really, um, you know, a lot of illness. It could be very bad and last a very long time and you know very painful death. So I, I really think that that's an exaggeration when someone says that. And my what I've always done is help them find what else they really do have. Thank you, Frank. And uh, we have a question, and this is uh, a really good question. Uh, again, uh, sometimes we get uh, all these questions. And this one specifically is about the social smoker you know that one that smoke occasionally and whether or not they are going to have the, exactly the same issues if you are a, a, a heavy smoker so the question from armando is what about people who don't smoke during the week they only smoke during the weekends what recommendation can you give? all right what i would do there is focus on the behavioral aspect of quitting they probably are not physically addicted to nicotine because they're not using it all week. They're just doing it in a very specific situation. So you really wanna work with them about changing the patterns that exist around their using. And, and it, generally speaking, these people are going out and having a few drinks and they're smoking while they're having a few drinks. So you may think, well, there's nothing else you could do. There is. So uh, very quickly, you know, go to a different bar or restaurant than you normally go to. 
people who do this tend to be very habitual and they do the same thing every time. So they'll go to the same place, have the same drink with the same friends. So find some other way of socializing for a few weeks, go to a different bar, drink something different. So if you're a if you're a beer drinker and you all and you smoke while you're drinking beer, then for a couple of weeks have a cocktail or have a uh, drink wine. I mean, very few people I know smoke while they're drinking wine for whatever reason. Um, go with a group of friends. Have a support person that is there with you. That a group of friends that doesn't that, that do not smoke. Have a support person there with you that you can talk to about this. So. And I'm just throwing all these ideas up. There's a lot of strategies. There's a lot of things you can do. But in that case, you're really focusing on the behavior changes and not worrying too much about using medications. Um, although, you know, there, there's no reason why they couldn't use a medication uh, in those, uh, uh, if, you know, if they're smoking quite heavily on those in, during the weekend. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so those are the questions. Um, before I forget uh, this is a webinar series we have more than one webinar uh, the national health care for the homeless council is getting ready for the second webinar you'll see information on the nchph website and the national health care for the homeless council uh, so stay tuned and thank you so much i would like to thank frank alina fide for this inform uh, for everything you know and this uh, webinar and uh, for the audience, please complete the evaluation survey. And uh, thank you so much for attending the activity. Have all of you a great Thanksgiving uh, week. And thank you for attending the webinar. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.